So colleagues, um, I wanted to, to provide you with a brief overview of, of the new strategic approach of WHO headquarters and regions. It integrates many of the regional approaches actually, but it's the overarching principle. And many things have already been said by Mark and Steph. And actually, I, I don't have to, to start again with this presentation. Nevertheless, I, I provided a brief overview. And I think there's going to be more. Um, Miroka is also presenting later on the integration of parts of early warning. And, and that's why I'm not um, emphasizing those aspects too much. So there's going to be more later. Uh, so I wanted to talk about um, HEPR, the Health Emergency Preparedness Response and res uh, res Response and Resilience Framework that the DGWHO has announced a while ago. Um, this is a framework um, that is meant to improve a, health, a global health emergency preparedness. And under this framework, there have been five interconnected components uh, defined, and one of them is collaborative surveillance. Now, collaborative surveillance on the right hand side, you find on this slide the definition I won't spell it out, but it's mainly about understanding surveillance in a new approach uh, about multiple information sources. So, uh, one of the major lessons learned, not only, only from COVID 19, but also other major recent events such as Ebola in African countries has been that if you follow just a very orthodox classical surveillance approach around indicator-based surveillance and hopefully some elements of event-based surveillance, that is not enough often to translate that into adequate, timely public health action. So we need to expand this concept towards other partly contextual components which are around or connecting to the information on the health system, the availability of hospital beds, ICU beds, oxygen supplies, vaccination coverage, et cetera, et cetera, effectiveness, effectiveness of the health workforce, and many other things. And all that needs to be contextualized and helps us to triangulate the existing surveillance information into the most effective public health action. So the lessons learned are amongst others that we, we, we need to know about health facilities, are they coping, which are the most affected and most vulnerable population parts. The decision-making in the beginning of an event, is this a true outbreak or is it a pseudo outbreak? And how are we going to follow up this? How many cases and deaths what do we have to monitor each day on a day-to-day -day basis in the ongoing event monitoring? And then how to adjust the response which are the additional resource needs that we have? Are our interventions effective or do they need to have, have need to be amended? And last not least, all the biological information uh, once virus have been birthed or other pathogens, which uh, variants are circulating, uh, which are the most dangerous ones, and so on. Now, at the heart of this concept is really that we are talking here about multiple information sources, not only in the public health sector, but also across the other sectors. So you see this is clearly a, a concept that addresses equally the animal, the veterinary and agricultural sector, and the environmental sector. We're talking here about integration within uh, between inter, uh, indicator-based surveillance and event-based surveillance, which ideally is integrated in, in national health systems. And we are going beyond this, this concept and integrate here healthcare availability information, contextualized information, also uh, behavioral and society ins insights, uh, for example, compliance to social distancing measures, social mobility data um, that you can derive from uh, cell phones and, and, and specific hazards and threats in the so-called vertical disease silos, integrating them across the horizontal early detection needs. And all that together is at the heart of this concept of collaborative surveillance. So the three main objectives here are, once has been mentioned, integration. A lot of integration has been mentioned here from Steph and Nora's side. Um, number two, um, that is mainly around um, the lab needs and net, net lab strengthening capacities, amongst others, point of care testing and the need for strengthening national capacities for genomic surveillance. 
And number three is mainly talking about collaborative approaches for event detection. That here means interoperability. We need to make systems speak together uh, across electronic platforms. We need the necessary amount of standardization and integration also in the IT piece. And all these principles, all these objectives are underpinned by certain enablers around governance, uh, sustainable financing, culture of trust, I think is, is quite mentionable. And um, under this framework, we have a very comprehensive set of um, very detailed uh, capabilities defined, and I'm going to show you a few of them in the next slides. So again, back to multi-source surveillance. Um, that has been mentioned a couple of times. Um, lab surveillance needs, event-based surveillance needs for early detection, indicator-based surveillance, in, including from other sectors, such as the animal sectors, economy, social insights, people's mobility, healthcare availability and health and strain on health system uh, information, strain on hospitals, hospitalization, ICU admissions, oxygen supplies, vaccine coverage, the uh, effectiveness of the health workforce and dropout rates around that, all that needs to be seen together. As you kind of mentioned, these different surveillance needs are different across the event life cycle. So uh, in the peacetime, let's say, you have very much an emphasis usually on Sentinel surveillance systems and indicator based surveillance. Whereas in an early event phase, we have a huge emphasis on event based surveillance. And then later in the event, we're pulling more and more information in around the burden on, on, on the health systems, for example, and that improves decision making process. So different needs across different event times. How is this now being done on the IT side? And I'm, I have apologies here for an example from Uganda, which is quite outdated. I want to, don't want to do you uh, injustice, uh, Prosper. Uh, this is from 2010. It's a bit outdated, but it's just illustrating. I don't take this so too serious. The, the different systems in one country only, um, how surveillance data and other data are captured across which levels and that uh, platforms data collection tools, then feeding into data warehouses, and then tools for data visualization. And all of that goes together. And, and then different APIs working together to make some of the systems speak together, others not. All that occurs in one country, and you can see this huge choice of solutions and options. And forgive me if that is a bit outdated, meanwhile. So what is the pain? What is, what is the problem here with this data collection? systems. There's data fragmentation that has been mentioned a couple of times today. We have multiple forms, multiple formats, multiple interests, multiple donors behind different diseases with different standards. Uh, some of them using suspect cases, others not. All these different case definitions need to harmonize uh, that better. Then the burden and duplication of data collection efforts is quite different across all these different systems and tools. There's limited guidance on standards and norms um, for unified and more harmonized indicators and the metadata around them and how they can feed into systems. Last but not least, delayed and inconsistent adoption of WHO surveillance guidelines. And again, these surveillance guidelines given by WHO are not necessarily harmonized. They are different in methodology according to uh, the vertical disease program needs and backgrounds for monitoring, and they're more following this approach of disease monitoring than the standardized approach for integrated surveillance. Now, I was talking about these capabilities um, under the HEPR collaborative surveillance framework. We have 1.1, which is uh, talking about integration and aspects. I'm just picking here a few of them. You can see how this all speaks now to those needs that I, that I have mentioned before. Um, there's mentioning of the integration of routine surveillance capacities across disease and threat specific verticals. That is between the vertical disease programs and then that being connected to the horizontal early detection 
needs that we have through event-based surveillance. And I know there are good efforts here in DHIS2 of integrating those indicator-based surveillance data with event-based surveillance data, for example. And then Miloka is going to speak later on other specific early warning needs and, and a system provided by WHO. Very important aspect, health service capacity, access, and usage monitoring. There has been mentioning of HERAMs in emergency uh, situations, emergency countries. That is really one contextual information need that we can ideally integrate through DHIS2 because DHIS2 per se is a broader health information system that captures this kind of information. And that is uh, really an opportunity here for collaborative surveillance approach. For the contextual community and one health insights, we had a very interesting meeting a couple of weeks ago in Rome, hosted by FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, discussing here how can we bring together human public health surveillance information and animal information uh, from the Empress I surveillance system in such countries hosting both of the systems or just one of the systems, DHIS2. I'm talking here about uh, very detailed about the data models. And this is really a, a very concrete approach of integrating sectoral information from these two sectors at the human animal interface. That is ongoing and work in progress. And further collaboration, the need to really strengthen digitalized um, data collection on the ground um, bottom up. Around lab, just um, pointing out one amongst many others, integration of point of care diagnostic results into national surveillance systems. The need to integrate best specialized point of care lab results into existing surveillance databases. And last but not least, um, the, the interoperational parts, integrated modern infrastructure, scalable technology interfaces, a lot have, has been mentioned here around APIs, integration of data systems, but we also need, and this is what we want to work on, at least we want to, in the next couple of months, take the temperature of what is to talk with the global donors, with the DDCs programs around them. What is the appetite for better harmonizing the data standards and the metadata for all diseases for one integrated surveillance systems? This is what we're going to start on, uh, also in discussion with the global donors of the very strong verticalized um, data systems. So we're following here amongst others. Um, this is just one of the major overarching principles. There's much more. Um, there's the, it has been mentioned here, the, the, the WHO data standards, um, but we're also following here the global strategy on digital health, which is talking and emphasizing about open source health data standards, reusability, reusable systems or assets, um, digital technologies, um, shared services and the good comparable quality of services through uh, digital tools and last not least the need to better harmonize syntactic and semantic interoperability between many different tools one of the overarching principles are the smart guidelines um, also hosted by who not going too much into details here but it's mainly about um prescription and the description of the existing data models and preparing them to, to go get digital, digitally and then really looking in the very uh, granular details in what are the needs to make these components in digital systems interoperable and translating them to software. These are the smart guidelines. So the future of all this, what we're thinking, we're thinking first of all about harmonized case definitions. We, we, we don't know if we can achieve this, but this is what we want to work about, but also reporting standards for exposure information, for example. Excuse me. Exposure information around um, food safety, food exposure, uh, sexual practices, um, any kind of exposure that is um, 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 important for reporting and contextualizing epidemiological information. But also, we're talking here about the non-functional requirements and how to make this data interoperable across many, many systems. 
And the concept we are following here is data normalization in the HL7 based uh, fire um, uh, interoperability uh, technology that's eating into different various data warehouses and then connecting the data visual visualization tools across those tools. And we have already started this work, for example, uh, HL7 fire based um, data dictionary uh, and wireframes are coming from the WHO code data application. And we have here uh, at least a, a framework and uh, data capturing um, templates that are following this standard. So last but not least, I wanted to just as a new division in Geneva and Berlin uh, division for um, uh, surveillance systems um, and how can we help in all those in all those attempts to um, make things better interoperable and harmonize and we basically have three overarching activities connection innovation and strengthening so we really here together with colleagues in Berlin um, in looking a lot into catalyzing efforts catalyzing funding convening communities of practice incubating cutting-edge initiatives and technologies, um, very much emphasis in Berlin on open source information for public health intelligence, but also strengthening standards. And we are really building up here a repository of up-to-date uh, best practices, norms, but also data standards we have in mind for surveillance that are better harmonized. Thank you very much. And I'm open for your questions or after probably. Sorry. Press this and this. Merci. It's very complicated. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, I mean, a lot of points were touched during the presentation, talking about um, indicator based surveillance, even based surveillance. This point, I saw it will really be touched by Rebecca in the last uh, in the last presentation as well integration with uh, response to emergency, with other domain, one of, I mean, emergency response is really a huge word. So thank you very much, Carl. And now I want to introduce Rospa Benisa from uh, Uganda, that is, is going to present us uh, the, um, the experience of East Uganda in the response of the Ebola uh, outbreak that was recently uh, in the country. Question we will at the end of the session, if it's okay. Thank you very much. I will prepare you the presentation. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, just to share a little bit about uh, uh, the experience of uh, using uh, DHIS2 in um, an outbreak. Um, uh, uh, we used the, with the recent um, Ebola outbreak in Uganda, that was the, uh, last year, September, October, uh, which had a few cases as I will share. Uh, but with the interest to want to see what we are able to do. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some rudimentary way of, you know, what most of you may now think is outdated, that is the SMS. Uh, I know in this room, very few people use SMS to, you know, communicate. Here we have all moved to WhatsApp uh, and all these other types of chats. But um, uh, the situation is going to be different uh, in where you know it matters, you know, and these are the communities uh, where you probably sometimes don't have connectivity, you don't have data, you don't have a smartphone, and so in the disease surveillance and emergency, you really need to be able to reach such communities because this is where it all starts from. So I will take you through um, a few things that we've been able to do over time that have really gotten us to uh, being able to respond to some of these emergencies, uh, quite in time to be able to, you know, shorten the, the length. Um, so um, for Uganda, for a long time, we've been trying to use DHIS2 for, uh, for case-based surveillance. 
Uh, but this case-based surveillance, um, looking at the whole journey since we started, uh, it's one of the implementation that is quite very challenging and very expensive to implement to the lower level. So we switched a little bit to see how can we start to, you know, start generating some of the things. So with the DHRS2, we have the, um, the tracker, uh, which is uh, used for, you know, case notification, lab resulting, and, the, you know, analytics. Um, really looking at also uh, feedback and timely uh, SMS and emails uh, notifications to the different stakeholders or the different players uh, in an outbreak or in disease surveillance. So this is part of the efforts that we have moved with uh, for since 2013. Uh, and basically, this is uh, the whole flow of how our disease surveillance uh, is meant to work. Some pieces may not be working very well, but at least some pieces are working okay. Uh, we do really look at what we call rumors for some of you who have been involved in this surveillance, but what we call alerts in, um, in Uganda. And, and this is basically based on an SMS notification, uh, an un unstructured SMS that really gets us started to ensure that we are able to, you know, get to the person who is reporting and uh, and be able to start the whole process. So um, this is the kind of thing uh, as it is, um, um, really just starting with an SMS, uh, anybody sending an SMS, and then we are able to get back to them. So it, to us, it's more being able to register the phone number of a person who is trying to report. Uh, and then we can be able to call them and you know um, and be able to get more information, which information is really really key for for surveillance that you can even you know start and then you're able to to reach out to them. So um, this uh, SMS is uh, uh, a of DHIS too. It's not something that we've been able to add on. So uh, whichever system you have, you'll be able to you know in configure the SMSs to be received by DHIS2 and be able to re be rebroadcasted. So that comes into our central database, which we're calling the EIDSR. And um, because these are uncoded SMSs, um, so you may not right away know where it's coming from. So it could be coming from a, you know, a different district or a different community, and you now want to start doing the triaging and the, and the and try to find out where this comes from so that you direct it to the right people to be able to respond. The nearby community, the nearby responders who can be able to communicate. So once that message is received, it's able to be viewed by different players. And um, that, that text message is you know, triaged or configured. Try to pick a few information. Sometimes you have to call this person and get you know, to where they are located so that we, we direct this message into to the right uh, um, team which is nearby and can be able to respond immediately. And along with that, we are keeping the log of all the actions that are happening uh, from the time of receiving the message up to the time of when the person or the case has been reached, uh, case investigation done, even results done. So we have that log that we keep along. And then uh, the most biggest players are the district, the lower levels who are near uh, some of these um, uh, points of uh, intervention. So this is typically how it is. Um, anybody who has um, a Ugandan registered SIM card, you can just go on your phone and just type a lot and just send to 6767. Now the 6767 code is a toll free uh, government paid uh, code. So that really also this allows us to reach multiple people. Um, during the COVID, most people are locked out, not even go and be able to buy uh, data bundles. So with this kind of communication, they could be able to communicate out of their bedrooms, out of their lockups, um, uh, lock and we are able to reach out to them into it to, to be able to get more information. Or people are allowed to move, who are allowed to go into that location and be able to meet. So what is really key is having um, this alert, even if somebody just stops there, we will be able to register the phone number and then we can get back to them and, and, and find out more information. Again, uh, in terms of feedback, once that message is sent, the system automatically sends you um, an, uh, a, a, a message telling you that uh, your, your message has been received and somebody is going to reach out to you. So at the central team and the different regions, uh, public emergency regions, you have uh, 
or any users who are looking at this system and be able to look at these uh, messages as they come in. So this is uh, what we were able to add on BHIS2 for just the SMS management. Otherwise, all these messages are received and stored within BHIS2, but uh, visualization of these messages is what we, are, if we have enhanced so that we have an easy to use platform and an API form that can be able to help us to, uh, you know, record the whole, the whole um, the way through the investigation. So um, different users, it could be at national level, regional EOCs or district, are able to see these messages that they come in. And you can able to see here, one was able to alert on a suspected Ebola case, uh, just out in the community there. And once it comes, uh, we are able to forward it to the right district by just clicking on this. And then this is what your uh, interface you are getting that feeds into your log of what uh, you are tracking. So at this point, you are able to extract some more information from the message, but also you can also be able to reach out to the, the, the reporter because they have their phone number and then be able to fill this information. Then as the investigation goes on, once the district has also started, the, has received this notification. So once we, we save this, then the notification is sent to the right district that we have selected here, like for example, this city here. And you'll also be able to receive a message on their email and their dashboard and also on their uh, uh, phone that there is now an investigation that they need to carry on. So at that point, they are now the, 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 the cascade will continue. And by the end of the day, uh, we should be able to see that what all the pieces have been touched and we can be able to tell what has happened. Sometimes these are false alerts, or sometimes there are potential uh, outbreaks, that, I mean, potential cases that we need to follow up. Uh, so this is when it reaches the district, this is basically what happens at the district. So at the district, they can further call the community, the reporter, to get more information. Uh, and this is, you know, a phone call back to them. Um, support and what to do. I mean, if it's a case that they need to isolate, at that point, you're already now beginning to, you know, put in some uh, emergency measures to, to be able to support this. Then if that requires that we now, the district now goes in to investigate, so they will get out with their case notification form and they will go in the lab equipment to be able to collect the sample. And at that point, they are also able now to enter into a tracker and enter now the whole full case investigation. And once that is entered, again, we have the notification to the different labs to be able to prepare for a sample that is coming their way for testing. So this will be now handled at the district level. Uh, so basically this is what uh, our case notification form looks, integrated case notification uh, form for both human and, uh, and animal and artificial disasters. And uh, again, this is um, trying to show that again with SMS, we are able to quickly be able to notify the different, the different groups. Uh, it is certainly that uh, we have groups of uh, uh, the different disease domains uh, to be able to notify them that there is something happening. So it could be at the point of lab results. It could be at the point of, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the, the case has been not, uh, registered into the system. And then, um, this, again, are the stages which we all have for most of our case uh, forms uh, for the different case 